Mikkel Ries Meisler præsenterer. Let me tell you all a story. You see, once I was looking for a house. Now I'm not I'm not a rich person, so I don't look for the big houses. In fact, I was looking for a cheap house. Now I'm not talking about handyman cheap, right? But that was my budget. Only I'm not a handyman. So out of you know curiosity maybe one day i'd find one i mean just find a catch get lucky you know and that happened i found a house that costs the equivalent of about a thousand dollars i mean didn't really look that bad on the picture it was i mean yes there was a lot of bushes and garden and stuff that had to be made but hey one thousand dollars i mean that's nothing i couldn't really believe it so what i did was i called the real estaters and and told them about i just saw the picture of the house and and, and the price and there was quiet in the phone i mean he didn't say anything and i said hey hey hello <laughs> it was it was like I, i thought the connection or anything and he says no no look you you don't want to buy that house i said no i, I don't know if i want to buy it but i i'd like to you know come and then we could take a look at it And there was quiet again. Hello? <laughs> well, anyway, he said that he they didn't really want to sell that house. But if I actually did want to come and have a look at it, I would just have to come down and get the key and go look at it myself. So I said, okay, <laughs> fine by me, I'll, I'll stop by. So I did that. And when I came in, he, he looked at me very concerned. And he said, Look, you don't want to buy that house. It's 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 not a good house anymore. But I insisted on it. Of course, I I wanted to take a look, and I am a, a curious person. So I mean, that only made me <laughs> maybe more curious, you know. So uh, he gave me the papers um, on the house, and then he went to the back room to to get the key. I looked at at the papers on the house. It was built in in 1912. Uh, that would make it more than a hundred years old, but that would only give it some charm, right? But I also saw that it was renovated in the years between 1946 and 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 49, which were the years right after the Second World War in Europe. So I was hoping that maybe it had been renovated, um, you know, beautifully. When he came out, he he held the key up in front of him. And that was an old key. I'm I'm talking. It was about twenty twenty five centimeters long. It was a long black iron key. It looked like an an oversized cupboard key, <laughs> not at all a front door key. But put it down on the counter, and then he took out some money from his pocket, uh, the equivalent of um, about a hundred dollars, and laid beside the key. And he said, "I'm going to ask you to make a choice here. You can take the key and look at the house, or I beg you." Take the money, leave this village, and just forget all about that house. Now I know today that I, I should probably just have taken the money and left. But I am a curious person, and that only made me more curious. So I took the key, smiled at him, and drove down to the house. Now the first thing I saw in the house was, of course, the the front yard. It was full of bushes and scrubs and trees and, and everything just filtered together in one big mess. I could hardly find the path up to the the front door, but I mean that's just the front yard. I mean, call in the bulldozers and, and and let them roll over everything, just pull it out and throw it all away and start over with a big lawn. And how much could that cost? That would be like two days of hard work for a machine, and we are still in a cheap house then. The windows were, of course, cracked and broken, and smashed, but the frames looked good, solid, strong, and straight. And the wall didn't look like cracked or anything. It was smooth, and, and, and the yellow paint was very tainted and bleached, and everything. And, and, and all the windows and half the wall was was covered in, in, in scrubs and plants, but they looked solid. They looked good. I was thinking, okay, this is this is so far so good. I mean, all right. Now the front door was was the most beautiful front door I've, I've ever seen. It was some solid oak, beautiful oval at the at the top and and big, big and heavy. 
and with a, a beautiful lock on it. I mean, it was it was uh, it was tainted and a, a bit rusty, but I'm sure it could be polished up real beautiful. First thing I thought was, yeah, we need chains on the inside and a proper lock on the outside. I mean, this is not a lock of modern days, but it was beautiful. When I unlocked the door, it was like a an echo went through the house. It was almost like I could hear every room. I pushed that heavy door real hard and it didn't really budge, so I had to, you know, really step into it. It was like a mini explosion in the hinges, I mean, a really big crack before it just opened up. That door had not been open for years, that's for sure. I was standing in a, in a hallway. To my left, uh, there was a, a kitchen. You could go through the kitchen into a, a dining room. And that dining room uh, continued at the end of the house on the left side into a, a living room. On the right side, there was a, a staircase up to the first floor. And under the staircase, there was a, another staircase down to the basement. And at the end, on the right, a little study room. We'll get to that. Now, the first thing I, I thought when I looked at these things was everything looked very dirty, of course, but fine. I mean, the walls, no cracks, no wallpaper, you know, hanging down in pieces, nothing like that. The floors were good, solid planks. I mean, fine wood. I mean, I was, I was very impressed. Didn't seem to be wet or anything. It was just not used and very, very dusty and dirty and dark. I remember the darkness. But I also remember thinking that that was because all the scrubs and the trees and the bushes outside the windows had, you know, blocked all the sunlight. Nothing out there. This didn't look like a, a big handyman job. I went into the, the kitchen and looked at the different cupboards and stuff and I thought I heard something. I remember I stopped and I, I held my breath to better hear but could have been outside. So I went into the, the dining room and, and, and that sound came a bit closer. I was thinking this, this sound, I mean I can hear it as if it's in the house. So I, I stepped real silently and as I came closer to the, the study, the door was, was opened a, a little bit, a crack. I could hear that it was, was from in there. And I could also hear the, the moaning. I mean, you, you don't doubt what two people are doing when they moan like that. It sounded remotely like two people having an intimate time. But I also have to admit that it did sound as if the woman wasn't enjoying it much. Actually, it sounded as if she was gagged and forced. Now, I'm no hero or anything, but I am curious. So I decided to be very silent and, and just to, you know, try and peek through the crack of the door, maybe. I first, you know, looked through the crack on, on, on the right side of the room. There was nothing in there, and, and then I slowly moved my head to the right, looking through the crack of the door, and my eye slowly caught a table, a desk, moving in, in a certain rhythm. I was convinced they were on that desk, right? So I just moved my head further to see. But at that exact moment, everything stopped. The sound stopped. The movement of the desk stopped. Everything stopped. It was just silent. With the one finger, I slowly pushed the door open as I looked into the room. There was just a desk and nothing else. There were no cupboards, there were no curtains, there were no open windows. There was nothing in that room. Nothing. And what caught my eye was, was this desk. It was a, an old desk. It was so clean I could almost see my own reflection in the surface. I mean, this was 
shining clean. I was, I have to admit, maybe a bit freaked out about it. And, and at the same time, I was like laughing to myself in a way, because this was, this was ridiculous. I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? So uh, I decided to go upstairs and look at the first floor before I take a look at the basement. So I went up there and there were two rooms up there and a bathroom. Rooms with, with walls, you know, at the angle as the roof. Two windows. Once again, there were good solid planks on the floor. Very dusty, but no renovation really needed. Nothing but good cleaning and paint. I was standing in the back room, looking out one of the windows into the backyard. Once again, it was like the front yard, all overgrown and plants entangled in scrubs and bushes and trees. And once again, I was thinking, call in the heavy works. I mean, a bulldozer and pull it all out, throw it all away and make a big lawn. No problem. But what really caught my eye was right down there in front of the stairs from the living room back door. There was a, a fountain, a white marble carved fountain like a pool, round, with weird looking faces carved on the edges. And in the middle of it, a tall statue of a nun standing up praying or something. Dirty, but that was beautiful. That just needed some cleaning. So I decided to go down and take a look at the backyard before I would uh, check, check out the basement. So I went straight out to that pool outside in the backyard. Now this, this statue in the middle, it was like three meters high. It was looking like this sad nun praying with her eyes closed. Beautiful it was. I mean, I stepped into the pool. Now there was some, some water in the bottom, but nothing big didn't seem to be ruined in any way. It was, it was very nice. And I was thinking, this, this, is, this is perfect. I walked around this, this statue for a few rounds while I was looking at it. And at one round, I saw some movement in the window of the house. I stopped and I checked out the windows. And I saw it again. There were shadows in there. I was a bit spooked about it. So I decided to, you know, go in and start calling. So I called out. I was there to look at it and they were welcome, welcome to step up, uh, shouldn't be afraid and stuff like this. But no one answered. But as I was walking through the house, I saw shadows. I know I saw things move. They were constantly at the edge of my eye. I saw moving shadows in front of the window. I could never seem to pinpoint them. It was as if there was something in that house. I must admit, it, it did spook me out. But I was really, at the same time, wanting this house because this was really a catch. And there was nothing much wrong with this house. So I was calling these things out. And while I was doing that, I decided, well, I might as well just keep talking and telling them that I'm going down to check the basement and, and then I'll be gone and be back to buy the house. And as I took the handle, of the basement door and opened it. It was like ripped out of my hand and shut so tight. It gave me a shock and blew me half a step away. Now, I saw the stairway on the other side of that door. There was no one there. There was no one. I think I was petrified for maybe two or two and a half seconds and then I just ran down that hallway slammed the door shut locked the lock and ran to my car my heart pounding away that got me spooked I mean this is weird we have a house here it is a gift I mean I'm a rational person if there is anything paranormal or anything maybe you could by a clairvoyant or someone who can come and cleanse the house. I mean, how expensive could that be? I mean, this was a house that was actually possible for me to buy, renovate, and live in 
and have a beautiful home. Even with all the plumbing that needs to be changed in the house or the electricity, the moaning down of everything and bulldozing in the gardens, even though all those expenses, it would still be a very, very cheap house. So I was thinking, on my way through the village, I saw there was a, a house with a sign out front, plumbing and electricity. So I thought I'd just, you know, stop by his house and hear him out on a price, just to find out what kind of expenses we're looking at. If we should have everything, all plumbing, all electricity, switched out in the house, how, how much would that be? Now, he was already standing in the window when I pulled over. And he came out through the door as I stepped out of the car. And the first thing he said was, are you all right? I said, I was just up at that house. He said, I know. Are you all right? <laughs> I asked him, what's the story with that house? There's nothing. He said, just forget about that house. I said, well, I, I, I can't forget about it because I'm thinking about buying it and stuff. So I told him that I was thinking that if I, if I should buy it, I would like a, him to make out a price on, on the plumbing and the electricity, how much and stuff. And he said, well, you're not going to get a price from me because I'm not stepping one step into that house. Just forget about it. And then he turned his back to me and went into the house. Like I said, I am a curious person, and, and this only made me more curious. I mean, now he needs to talk to me. Come on. So I knocked on the door and asked him to please tell me something. And boy, did he tell me something. Well, he invited me in and offered me a beer. And we sat down by the kitchen table, and he started to tell the bloody story of that house. It was built in 1912 for a priest who was supposed to be the priest of the town. It was financed by the state church, and they had given the village a church and a house for the priest. Now the workers would start by building the house, and then they would build the church. Now the weird thing was that in 1912, when the house was done, all the workers disappeared. They disappeared into thin air. It's not like they, they just stayed away from the work with the church. No, they disappeared. And the priest, he was found in the basement, lying on some demonic star with some occult signs written all over the basement floor. Candles lit around him, and everything seemed as if it was a sacrifice. Now the Vatican itself, all of a sudden, appears in this village with a man who came to cleanse the house. It is said that he demanded that the house should be shut down for a full generation. A tall wooden fence with Christian signs and phrases from the Bible all to be written all around the house and no one was to enter for 30 years. And so it stood for two world wars. No one entered. It just stood there. It was all forgotten until 1946. A German man bought the house and he renovated it for three years to 1949. This man's name was Gerhard Gruyer, but he was called Cruel instead. He was cruel. He was big and brute, he was strong, and everybody feared him. The lawmen feared him, even the mailman feared him. Everyone in town feared him. He was described as someone who could bash people around for just saying the wrong thing. Everybody feared him, and he became the bully of the town, or the king of the town. He made the house into a small kind of bed and breakfast thing. At least he was advertising that travelers could get a bed and a, a morning meal. But all travelers that went to that house disappeared. Everybody in the village knew of this, and everybody who knew was frequently reminded not to talk about it. It is said that an unspeakable number of travelers have disappeared in this area, and everybody knew that it was in that house. 
But in 1955, it is said that the villagers had had enough. They gathered up with a lot of weapons, overpowered him in his own house. It is said that it was done while he was raping a woman in the study on the desk. They hacked him to pieces in that room. It is said that the villagers cleaned up everything. They maintained the house, they paid the bills, they emptied the mailbox and kept that house running for 10 years. So no one knew that he was gone. But it is also said that during those 10 years, people in the area disappeared one by one. And in 1965, 10 years after, the maintenance stopped. This village was like a ghost town, he said. Half the village had just gone. It was dark and full of secrets. It took many years to build up this village and society again. But still, people disappear in this area. And it's been going on many times through the years, he says. In 1974, three campers were found in the basement, lying on the floor with demonic signs written on it, their heads cut off and switched around. And in 78, two campers were found in a tent in the backyard, their heads switched, and the fountain was full of their blood. And then in 1986, six students and one teacher were killed in that house. They were from some paranormal faculty trying to investigate paranormal activity. They were all killed, all found in the basement, all with their heads cut off and switched around. And all around them were demonic or cult signs. Once again, a man from the Vatican all of a sudden pops up in the village. And once again, he demands the same closure. The whole house shut down. A big, tall fence all the way around the house and signs written on this wood. For 30 years, once again, the house was condemned to solitude, closed, no one to enter. In 2016, the house was, so to speak, free once again. But the town council, they quickly decided they did not want this house. So they demanded the real estate company to sell it. They, of course, didn't want it either, so they said, no way, we're not doing it. So the town council actually made a law saying that the real estaters, they should sell it by law. Okay, the real estaters said. And then they just set the price to a million. Nobody wanted to sell that house. Nobody wanted to go near that house. Once again, the town council decided by law that that house was to be sold for not a penny more than the equivalent of $1,000. Demanded by law. People have come to look at that house. None of them have wanted to buy it. And he told me not to buy it either. He said, nobody in town is going to talk to you. Nobody is going to want to do any work in or near that house. And people would probably fear me and not even want to talk to me. With his words in mind, my mind was made. That house had something that I did not want to buy. That's for sure. It was a cheap house. It would have been a good catch. But there is too much of all of this blood and bad story. So I drove back to this real estate company and when I walked through the door, <laughs> he looked so relieved to see me and even more relieved to hear that I was not interested in buying the house. So we shook hands and I drove back home, trying to follow his advice, just leave the village and forget all about that house. And I actually think, despite it all, that I succeeded. I did forget about that house. That's probably why it felt like the strike of lightning and punch in the belly to see that house in some news bulletin on my TV screen. I turned off the volume. It turns out that four young boys and a girl had entered this house. The girl had allegedly been raped 
by some guy in this house, in the study, on a desk. She had told her friends, and these four young boys had armed themselves with bats. They went into this house to find whoever it was. Three of the young boys and the girl were all found dead in the basement, their heads chopped off and switched around. The last boy, he made an escape. He told the whole story to the police. They are making a full investigation, and they don't want to talk to the reporter. And then she talks to some university professor from some paranormal faculty, talking about how exciting it is that this house has a story, and that he and a group of students will investigate in paranormal activity in this house. As she signs off, she almost giggles and says that she will follow up. I guess the story of this house is not yet over. Hvis du kan lide kanalen her, så abonner og få mere.